Oh, hi, welcome. Welcome, Erin Wu. We have Erin Wu here to talk about essentials of having a living trust. I believe a lot of people do not think there is an urgency of setting up a living trust for themselves. However, Aaron has his own point of view. Right now, we are proudly to have Aaron here to tell us about why and how to set up a living trust. Aaron, are you we, here yet? I think we have Aaron Wu and Andy Lee from Lee and Wu LLP. So they're both on the line. Yeah, I'm, are we doing I'm English first or Chinese first? Uh, English do... from three to three thirty. Yep, exactly. Um, can you guys hear me? Mm, I we can hear you, but we cannot see you. We prefer we can see you. Of course, of course. Let me um, put my screen share first, um, or start sharing my screen first, and then I'll also turn on my video as well. Just give me one second. <clears throat> All right, can you guys see me? Yes, we do. Yes, we are seeing you. Yeah, sorry, I'm a little, a little unkept. It's been about a month and a half since my haircut, so <laughs> excuse the uh, little bit of ruggedness. All right, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Aaron, and um, my partner Andy Lee will be joining us as well. He'll be speaking on the um, uh, for estate planning and trusts from the Chinese perspective. Um, in the Chinese language, I'll be speaking in it from uh, the English side, okay? Um, today, we're gonna be covering um, trust estate planning in general, uh, the benefits of it and um, what the perks are and why it's important. Um, generally, I, um, I start out with more of an introduction into estate planning overall. Um, for the most part, I believe a lot of people have heard about estate planning already, so I'm going to try and not go too deep into the details there, but keep it more open to the questions um, if you have any. All right. Um, and Victoria, are we going to take questions mid presentation or are we going to wait till the end? It's up to you. Okay. Awesome. Well, I can do. Um, and do either either one. Let's just, if you have questions as I'm going along, feel free to ask. Uh, I do want to keep in mind that um, the English session is for 30 minutes. So, and we start, it's already 3.05 now. So I'm going to try and breeze through this, but I'm going to try and answer as many questions as I can. Okay. Um, so as I said earlier, today's presentation is primarily just to uh, generate awareness, um, talk about what options are out there in terms of the estate planning and also just to answer uh, what is estate planning, who should create a estate plan when, and what happens if you don't have one. Um, always with a disclaimer for all attorneys and all the CPAs that are out there, you um, usually put it put this up. Um, information is covered, not meant to be legal or financial advice. So please, um, if you have any like specific questions, we can talk about it afterwards, but Generally, this is just more for informational purposes only. So the basics of an estate plan. So effectively, an estate plan really helps you prepare today for tomorrow and for the future. Um, it helps you prepare for your estate, um, helps, helps you take care of your personal health, um, prepare for your children, guardians, taxes, and so forth. Um, it is something that people tend to take, um, like, I like to begin a little bit later on in their lives. However, estate planning as a whole, I, I highly recommend getting started a little bit earlier so that you can start planning ahead. Um, because when one does estate planning, they they really look not just at what they have today, but also how um, and how to prepare to distribute it in the future, but also potentially at maximizing what they have today, like um, protecting yourself, asset protections, structures, and so forth. Um, and just so that I'm clear in regards to questions, do people generally send them into the chat or, um, or how should I proceed with that? I see some popping up here, but. They'll be asking them in the chat. We can ask them or you can just include them into your presentation. So whatever's easiest for you. Okay, can, um, if, you might, if you don't mind just asking it, that'd be great. And then, uh, so I don't have to, 
I wouldn't divert our um, presentation. Um, so I'll just can we... cut you off in the middle. So maybe you can just first talk about a few pages and then you let me know when is good time to ask your questions. Sounds good. Um, all right, then I, I'm going to keep, I'm going to proceed on then. Um, so general estate planning documents, typically in an estate plan, there are four documents. There's the revocable living trust, a will, a durable power of attorney, and also your advanced healthcare directive. All of those plan different phases in your life. Um, I will go through a majority of this um, in the upcoming slides. But effectively, in an estate plan, um, one sec. Right, in an estate plan, what is included in your estate is effectively everything that you own. So residential property, commercial real estate, personal property. Um, the big divider is whether or not people are married. Um, in, in California, we are a community property state, and thus we uh, recognize separate property and community property. Community property is every, the assets that you um, accumulate after you get married, assuming that there's no prenuptial or no other types of agreements there. Separate property is any property that you receive based upon an inheritance, um, pre anything that you've accumulated before marriage, uh, gift, and so forth. Uh, who should consider an estate plan? Um, I've listed three, uh, three different factors here. However, there are several more, but these are the primary ones. Um, people who have assets above $166,250. Uh, this is in total. So real estate, cash, personal property, all of that. Um, and the reason being is because the threshold in California is that if you have over $166,000 in assets after you pass, then you will have to go through the probate courts. Um, and in probate court, they there's a lot of fees. There's the, uh, mandated attorney fees as well. So there's really a lot that can be taken out of your estate if you don't, uh, if you have above $166,000. Uh, the next factor that helps, uh, not helps, excuse me, that uh, you should consider uh, as to whether or not you want to estate plan is if you have children under the age of 18. Uh, this primarily is for guardianship and the guardianship is usually nominated in the will. Um, and the third facet here is when you have your assets, you want to distribute it in, um, you, you probably want control of who you pass your assets onto, how you want to structure assets, perhaps in the most tax efficient ways, um, perhaps even um, prevent assets from going from, uh, to certain parties that you don't want them to go to. And thus a big perk of having either a trust or a will is to be able to control your assets and how they're distributed in the future. Um, why should you have an estate plan? Primarily probate avoidance, as I mentioned earlier, you save a lot, um, you will save a decent amount of money. Probate can cost anywhere between three to 8% of your estate. And that is not like, I believe that this is, uh, if you look at real estate, and I believe that this group is primarily in real estate, it's not your, your equity in the property, it's the actual value of the property. And thus, um, when you go into probate, if you have to go into probate, um, the attorneys and the parties that are involved um, have a statutory right to some percentage of the total um, estate value of your, yeah, of your estate. And thus, if you had a property that you had $200,000 in equity, but it's worth a million dollars, well, the attorney would have, I believe it's 3%, depending upon the different tier of um, estate value, but they'd have a statutory right to 3% uh, on that million dollars, not the two hundred thousand dollars. So, um, probate avoidance is probably the biggest reason to uh, have an estate plan, and specifically uh, to establish a living revocable trust, because a will for, uh, mandates you to go into pro uh, probate, whereas a trust is essentially uh, a list of instructions that distribute your, your assets before you have to cross that finish line. Um, the next. Uh, that's the uh, next fact of why you should have an estate plan is because you ha uh, have control over your estate. Um, you have the ability to control who you're going to pass off um, your property to. Um, guardianship for who you want to nominate to take care of your child in, in case something happens. And finally, one thing that people don't recognize enough is the ability to be able to make decisions for themselves in the future. Um, 
today we have um, obviously the COVID-19 is uh, prominent and uh, in that sense, when folks are not able to make their decisions, you wanna be able to control as much as you can beforehand, unless you're comfortable leaving that in the hands of let's say your relatives or doctors that are uh, working with you. Uh, because to a certain degree, um, when you, like if people fall sick, it, it actually, um, it's not mentioned enough that people are concerned about, oh, when they pass, but there's a period of time where people come um, come to a point where there's potential like um, dementia, mental diseases and so forth, where if you pass that point and you are, um, um, it is determined that you do have a, um, a mental disorder where you cannot make your decisions anymore. Well, unfortunately at that point, you cannot make your plan, or you cannot determine who you want to give things to. You cannot determine how you're going to be able to make your decisions. And if you don't do that ahead of time, unfortunately, that's, um, it'll be taken care of for you by the courts. And what happens if you don't plan? Um, and this is specific for your assets. Um, at, well, excuse me, at disability, court gets to decide um, who gets to oversee your assets. They nominate somebody to look over you. Um, at death, the California has probate laws. Um, and thus, um, if you don't decide yourself, the, court, uh, the California regulations have decided for you. So the negative around probate is also the fact that you don't have control, but also because when you go through probate, you have to go through probate in front of a judge at the courthouse. So all of your assets are up, uh, itemized and the accounting is done in front of the courts, in front of the general public. This slide is pretty long. This effectively covers um, the perks of a living revocable trust, but, effective, but the main perks of it are probate avoidance, um, your ability to control your assets, um, you can provide for charitable, charitable intentions, and also you can stipulate um, how you want to distribute your assets to folks. Like let's say um, if you have a child that you plan for them to go off to college and you want to incentivize for them um, to continue studying in school rather than just giving them an estate, uh, you can structure it so that you can reward your uh, son or daughter after they graduate from school, um, if they graduate, and they, then you can reward them with X in your estate. So you can stipulate different types of um, perhaps milestones and achievements. Now, some things that living revocable trusts do not do though, or they do not provide specific asset protection. Um, there is a difference between an irrevocable trust and a revocable trust, but I'm not gonna get into that, to, into that today. But asset protection is a strategy that you can leverage, um, but not necessarily through revocable trust, but it, um, but it all comes, it can come up during the estate planning process as to how you can protect the assets. Um, next thing is, um, it does not protect against cost of long-term health care. The creators, um, it does not affect the creator's income taxes um, unless you have, uh, you can structure estate tax reductions. However, um, at some point, um, certain taxes will get to you. And finally, refinancing may be a little difficult if you have um, property in the trust name but that's pretty simple. You just move it out of the trust, refinance and move it back in. Um, I do notice that we have um, several questions. So I'm gonna leave this slide up for a second and I will take some questions. Uh, one of the questions is what's the impact of the living trust on income tax return of a married couple, joint couple who has ownership of properties? Is there any difference when it comes to no. the income tax? No. There isn't. There isn't. So the revocable living trust is effectively um, all it really is is a contract that effectively determines where you're going to place your assets in the future. It does not change your um, tax status. Uh, it does not provide you a new tax ID. Um, and thus, any type of revenues that you would have generated already that would have come to you directly would still come to you. Like it, you still see it in that same way. Uh, another question is, 
um, can you exclude properties that you partner with other parties and one's estate plan? And if you can exclude it, should you, what are the risks? What's good, bad about excluding or not excluding? Sure. So this one is pretty common, especially if there's a ten, like a TIC. Um, so generally you want to include as much as you can in your estate um, and the, the perks of including it are that you control like where your property interest goes. Um, it all depends upon the operating agreement, if, it, if it's an LLC or the, just the, bio, like the bylaws that are involved as well. Some structures do not allow for you to pass off like the interest of a property directly to, your, um, to who you decide, but instead it forces a um, first right of refusal uh, for the group that's involved. Um, that's one thing I'd like to point out, but the, I would highly encourage those that have, um, have partial ownership, whether it be in a property, in an LLC, or any type of uh, entity, um, to consider putting it into their living trust because, um, because of the fact that, well, when it comes time, uh, when the day comes and you pass, whatever is not funded in your living trust and retitled in the name of your living trust will be looked at as if it's still in your estate. And once your estate goes above the $166,000 um, threshold, then you're going to have to go through probate. So let's say if you had nine properties or 10 properties and the um, and one of them was worth like maybe a million dollars and you split it with five people. So it's like $200,000. Um, well, if you did everything for your nine properties, great. Like those things are going to be distributed uh, appropriately based upon your estate plan. But that one property, um, well, it will affect you and um, you'll have to go through probate because you're above that threshold. Now, the other thing about not having um, the property in your estate plan is that, well, probate can take place in multiple states. So if you have a property, let's say you're located, let's say you have five properties, two of them are located in like Vegas and Austin, Texas. Um, and let's just say there's their property here in San Francisco. Um, and you have to go through probate like, and you forget to put those properties into your estate plan. Well, you're going to have to go through probate in San Francisco, in Vegas, and also in Austin, Texas. So putting, um, putting properties into your estate are pretty important. And again, if you choose to exclude it, um, I usually recommend against that. But at the same time, they, you can't be passive it, when it comes to ownership and who's involved. Can I, uh, Aaron, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, let's say um, if a husband and wife own uh, LLC, yes. each has a 50% interest, how, yes. do you, how do you put this uh, LLC into your trust? And the husband and wife have 50% interest each? Uh, each. Yeah. So there, um, I have a document which effectively transfers the interest um, the LLC interest ownerships into the name of the trust. And then from there, um, you execute that document, you have it notarized, so it effectively, like, you transfer it into the name of the trust there. And on the other end, um, you would have to change the statement of information um, that's registered at the state level. Hello? Yes, um, I, I think another question is, if an attorney is hired to administer a trust, Mm -hmm. Will he or she charge 10% of, for the administration fee? Or what is the set standard for the fee that the attorney uh, charges if it goes to probate or if it goes to, uh, if uh, they need to administer the trust? Okay, so those are two different questions. Trust administration and probate administration are different. Trust administration, um, some firms take it, like they have to see how large the estate is first. To, um, and usually they'll, what will happen is that they'll review the trust. They'll probably charge you a little bit of my initial fee or they may uh, waive that initial fee, but they have to get a better understanding as to how complicated the trust administration may be. Um, so that's the first point. And um, in that sense with trust administration, um, if you are uh, administering a trust, the attorney um, is the, essentially the consultant to the trustee who manages the trust, 
And in that sense, the trustee still gets to make all the decisions and so forth, but the, the cost of it typically is more um, based on an early rate, uh, early basis, not um, a percentage, but some firms charge a little differently. Now, when it comes to probates, they can do this. You can have the same structure, as I mentioned earlier, there's a statutory rights that the attorney can have, can elect to charge you. Um, and it depends on the estate value. Unfortunately, I don't have it in my slides here, but there's a different type of tier. Um, and they tear off, I believe, um, every I mean, like 500,000 and a million, a couple million from there. Um, and I'm happy to show, um, provide that to you guys a little bit later on. But in regards to how much one may charge, it's up to the attorney to quote you a fee there. Another question is, um, uh, does the trust have to file a separate tax return? Um, and can you put properties in a partnership into a trust? Um, to answer the first question, no, you don't have to file a separate tax return unless you create an irrevocable trust. Um, and depending, depending on the purpose, but usually um, for the most part, Revocable trust, you do not have to file a separate tax return, but irrevocable trust, you do. Now, um, what was your second question? The second question was, can you put properties from a partnership in a trust? Yes. And I guess the other question related to that is, can you deed the properties now or are the recorder offices closed? Oh yeah, you can deed them now. Um, so you can transfer them now, yes. Um, you have to go through a process though. It, the recorder's office is open, but it takes a little bit longer. There is something on your slide that says estate tax reduction for married couples on the slide mm -hmm. uh, under your bullet, like yeah. bullet yeah, number like seven six. or something. What does that mean? Okay, so estate tax reduction for married couples. Um, there are different instruments that you can utilize with uh, within a trust. So a living revocable trust is, um, it's on a high level, just seen as a trust. But within a trust, you can um, stipulate different types of conditions to take place and effectively create sub-trust within a living revocable trust. Um, and that is state tax reduction. So on the federal level, the estate exemption right now is about, I wanna say 11.58 million dollars per person. Um, and that, uh, when you combine the two with the married couple, which you can do um what is that like 27 so um when you when one couple like when one spouse passes if you're above that threshold you can stipulate that certain um assets or, or a new trust is created as one passes and it is held outside of the name of the um of the initial ben like the spouse that would benefit um, and effectively like reduce your tax exposure if you're above the estate um, exemption level. So in doing so, that's how you can reduce it at least initially. So that's a little bit more uh, complicated uh, yes. question. You may want to have further conversation with Aaron and consultation. Here's yeah. another question related to um, from Audrey. Do both husband and wife name need to be on the trust name or can it be X family trust and just one of the name trustees on title of real estate? Okay, so um, first off, when you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, send up a trust, you effectively are creating a contract and, and in terms of effectively like in the future distributing the assets, um, you have a trustee that steps in and has to um, administer that trust. Now, when it comes to how you name the trust, you can name the trust whatever you'd like. Um, it, as I mentioned earlier, there's revocable trust, irrevocable trust. Um, in California, the, uh, for the most part, when it comes to trust, you have the ability to be able to figure out who, like you can dig a little deeper to figure out who owns the trust. Um, in other states, they do have mechanisms where they make it a little bit harder for you to identify who does. Um, so there's certain asset le protection levels there, but to answer it on a, at a very uh, point blank, like, can I name the trust XYZ trust or family, like the um, Aaron Wu trust? Yes, you can. Um, and for the trustees, 
if you're married, normally you have both um, husband and wife be the trustees, like co-trustees, um, but you can't stipulate that only one acts as trustee. There's uh, one that says, can different trustees be named on different properties? So if there's property A, B, and C, we want Bob as trustee on A, we want Mary for B, and we want you know, Lily on C. Can that be named in, in the trust? You can identify the responsibilities for a trustee. So you can have, like, you can have multiple like co-trustees and um, add more responsibility with them. And I'm gonna continue on with the presentation just because I know that we've got a couple more minutes before Andy starts. Um, but happy to take more questions uh, either after or um, perhaps if Andy finishes early. So um, this is just, this is a slide just to show like how does the process work first. Of uh, um, the person setting up the trust identifies the uh, parties that he wants involved. The said the said lore is the person who puts the assets into the trust. Um, the trustee is the one who um, manages the assets in the trust, and the beneficiaries are the ones who receive the assets in the future. I do want to point out that the trustee initially, um, in order for it to be a living revocable trust, the person who creates the trust is the initial trustee um, in charge of managing the trust. And that's what makes it revocable. Um, part two, you create the terms and conditions. Three, you execute the documents. And uh, nowadays you can, um, uh, you can, or we can, we have drafted estate plans for folks um, and distributed it to them virtually. And there are um, online notaries as well to be able to execute these documents. Um, four is fund the trust, so you have to retitle the assets into the name of the trust. And five, um, you just continue, the way that, uh, continue living the way that you do. Because ultimately, all you're doing is just setting up that, um, these stipulations in the future for how things will pass. So, and it doesn't change your tax ID, so there's no, uh, no issues there. What can you do with assets in a revocable living trust? There's a long list to effectively say you control the property still. Um, even if it's a partial interest in a business or partial interest in an, a property, you still own that partial interest directly. Um, but effectively, you can do everything and anything that you could normally do with, um, even if you didn't have the trust in between. And also, you can revoke the trust and name a successor trustee as well. Um, I'm just going to quickly cover wills. Um, so a will, as many know, can also determine how you want to distribute your assets um, and how things are get, going to get paid in terms of debts, taxes, and so forth. Same thing with a trust. The thing is that with a will, um, those force probate to take place. So if you want your estate to go in front of the judge to make sure that everything goes appropriately, um, well, you may want to elect to have a will. However, as I mentioned earlier, there are statutory fees when you go into probate. Um, so that's one of the, um, one of the factors that would push against going in for a will. And the other fact is that when you go through probate nowadays, it can take anywhere between eight months to, I hear San to Clare County is taking about 18 months nowadays for, uh, probate or up to 18 months. <coughs> um, the other perk of having a will though, is that you, this is where you would name your guardian for your, um, for your child if you pass, um, and they're, and your children are still minors. And um, finally, um, you can also stipulate in your will um, in combination or in support with your trust that anything that you did not list in your trust distribution plan at, that passes, like if you didn't have it in your trust and it goes to probate, you can actually list it so that you can say, hey, I want my uh, assets to go in the distribution plan that I set in my trust. So if you had a, let's say you bought a property one day and you forgot to put it into the trust, you pass, but in your trust, you said, hey, I want it to go to, like 33% 30, 30, to go to my brother and the other 66% to go to my cousins. Like your will could stipulate like, oh, anything that I didn't catch, well, I'm gonna put it back into the trust and, and it'll be distributed in that way. So, yes. And uh, this is a helpful slide, um, I believe, 
this is being recorded, but if not, I can also share my slides afterwards as well. This just tells you the difference between a will and a trust, the perks of having a trust versus a will. But ultimately, you want to have both. Um, you want to have a revocable trust that stipulates everything so that you don't have to go into probate, and you'll want out the will so that you can um, effectively establish a guardian because um, trusts don't go in front of the judge, but wills do. You want to have the, uh, the judge make sure that the child is assigned to the appropriate um, guardian. Um, this is a quick case study. I know I'm a little over time now. Um, Marilyn Monroe, she had, um, she had an estate plan, but the thing is she drafted it in, like she didn't draft it uh, very thoroughly. Ultimately, she had a coach that uh, she wanted to give her assets to. And she said, I'm gonna leave it to my, um, like my residue to my coach, like everything that I haven't named to specific beneficiaries, I'm gonna give the remainder of it to my coach. At that point in time, nobody had talked to her about intellectual property. They didn't know that she was going to have royalties and um, have a lot of um, um, income in the future. And because they didn't think consider that, um, it was looped into the residue itself. And as it was supposed to be distributed to the coach after she passed, um, she set a secondary person to receive it so that if it wasn't the coach, it would go to his wife. But the thing is, she did not mention which wife. Um, she did not mention the name of the wife and the, the wife that Marilyn Monroe knew and she wanted to go to. Um, well, by the time that the estate was settled and things were coming, like were being distributed, well, unfortunately, the acting coach did not have the same wife anymore. So this new wife took everything um, and never knew Marilyn Monroe at all. And by the way, uh, this went through probates because uh, there are a lot of other issues with it. It took 40 years to go through probates for Marilyn Monroe's estate. Um, so, yes. Uh, here's some things that we just did not cover today. Asset protection strategies, complex trusts, um, advanced healthcare directive, durable power of attorneys, but happy to go through that in the future. And finally, what's considered today? Well, execution of estate plans, um, as I mentioned, we're able to, um, Andy and I are taking new, uh, we've been taking clients during this time. We've uh, been able to execute estate plans with our clients as well virtually um, and have online notarization and so forth. And finally, the other thing to consider, if you don't wanna go with the trust will and so forth is just an advanced medical directive. So this is just more of like, just in case what happens, uh, you can stipulate who's gonna be in charge of your medical um, care, medical attention. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so Aaron, what is the general cost to set up living trust? Like, do you put mobile motor homes, vehicle, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Does cost goes up the more assets that you have, that you're adding? Um, so the general cost, it, it ranges. Because it, like, let's say, first off, these things aren't one size fit, fits all, as you may be aware. Obviously, if you have many different, um, like if you have a whole list of like real estate or of um, different like uh, insurances, or let's say you have um, a mixed family where you have a stepson or stepdaughter, or you have like uh, different, you've gone divorced and so forth. And you have to determine like what is yours and like how you, how you want to fund the trust. Well, all of those are factored in. Um, typically, a trust. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, the prices do range. Um, individuals maybe about maybe fifteen, uh, maybe fifteen hundred to about two thousand ish, somewhere around there. Uh, but if it's more complicated, then it can be more. Um, but also maybe less um, for. Um, for couples, it's like maybe 2,500, so maybe like th uh, 3,500, four or so, depending on how, again, how complicated it may be, it may be more, maybe less. Um, yes. Okay, so thank you, Aaron. Um, now we wanna get your partner, Andy Lee. Hello, Andy. So we want to have Andy Lee to talk, to go over 
um, the information that you just go over or with some additions in Chinese. So hi, Andy. Hello. Hey, Andy, they hope. Hey, 超過十六萬六千蚊的資產以上就應該馬上去成立一個Living Trust 不如我們由這裡開始說起Hello Andy Andy, you need to unmute yourself Hello, Victoria 是的,是的,我們剛才是聽不到的 OK,大家好,Victoria你好 你覺得自己會去到地步 你覺得你子女開始大了 這件事,遺產規劃就需要去考慮 在加州,California, under California rules,所以最理想的情況就是你簽了一個遺囑,做了所有文件 每個人的情況不同,因人而異。那為什麼如果你有超過16萬6千元以上的資產 遺產規劃是一個很大的umbrella 
一個好重要嘅 medical decision。你想唔想有個人幫你誒同、呃、你揸揸決定，要唔要去掹喉或者或者做一啲好 serious 嘅嘅誒 decision？ 呢樣嘢係四樣嘢，係 under 我哋嘅誒 general estate planning， 即係個。嗰、那個誒遺、呃、產規劃下下邊嘅四樣嘢，咁你話誒、uh, living trust 即係生前信託係其中下邊嘅係一環，誒點解要去到十六十六萬或者屋企有小朋友先去做咧？咁 relate 翻我之前講樣嘢啦，咁你十六萬係係誒政府同你講，如果你個如果你有你個資產總值係十六萬嘅。咁你個資產係包括好多樣嘢喎，包括當然係你嘅房地產啦、你部車啦、你嘅首飾啦，就算你屋企入面有嘅、呃，有一啲名牌手袋，都係當係會納入呢個遺產嘅規管範圍嘅。咁如果你去到十六萬，誒、呃、呢、這個即係總資產去到十六萬，當你唔響到嘅時候，咁但係你亦都冇一個、呃、生前冇冇、呃、成立一個有效嘅遺囑同埋遺產嘅規劃。咁你呢十六萬係要經過法庭嘅認證，先可以將呢筆呢筆財產分配俾你下面一啲繼承人嘅。咁、呃、如果你個認法庭嘅認證個程序係比較煩啦，第一個要時間啦，第二樣要錢。正常嚟講係會、呃、要你花費大概你嘅總資產大概三個 percent 左右嘅，即係你,你如果係有、呃、你就算你得間屋好一百萬。正係誒，正係遺產認證法庭認證呢個程序，律師費加埋個法庭嘅收費，大概已經去咗你三萬蚊。咁重要嘅時間，你個你個繼承人未必會馬上攞到錢。如果係啲 title 上邊有啲好繁繁複嘅問題嘅話咧，係要、呃、一年係好正常嘅。咁多過一年或者去到兩三年，亦都會有可能發生嘅事。咁對於你屋企有小朋友嚟講，誒、呃、當你唔喺度，咁佢哋。首先已經唔見咗筆錢啦，第二個佢哋係未必會好快攞到繼承你個繼承人，你個小朋友，你個屋企人未必會去誒好、呃、有效同埋好 efficiently 去繼承到你筆遺產，因為佢個程序會會好繁複同埋會好冗長。係 ，Victor 嚟啊，答唔答到你嘅問題？ Andy 啊，有人想問咧，誒、呃、一個 TODD 同埋個 Living Trust 有咩區別咧？你可唔可以講？誒、呃、TODD 咧係純粹係 TODD 係純粹係一間屋嘅，咁誒、呃、純粹一間屋嘅，咁你只要去同個 city 簽咗 TODD， 咁你嗰個遺產即係、就是、你嗰間屋係講緊一間屋，你自住間屋就可以直接過落去俾你嗰個繼承人喺度。咁遺產咧就誒。呃那個包含嘅東嘅東西會廣闊好多嘅，咁唔單止係間屋，你嘅車啦，誒同埋你嘅首飾啦，你或者有嘅銀行帳單啦，呢啲係 TODD 唔會包嘅 ，TODD 淨係淨係包你間屋自住間屋，咁你遺產規劃係你想包乜都可以，係個係個誒覆蓋率會係大好多嘅。咁之前有客户因為誒話將間屋立。左入去俾 TODD 就影響咗佢攞 equity line， 即係房屋淨值同埋 regular loan。嚇，咁我哋都有聽過呢一樣嘢喎。如果係擺左入去個 trust 入邊，又會唔會影響重貸啦、攞房屋淨值啦，同埋誒喺其他方面，譬如買屋嘅時候會有好大嘅影響咧？應唔應該咁樣做咧？將目前嘅物業，不管你係咪會持有到老，都先放佢入去個 trust 度咧。你個 trust 度正常嚟講咧，嗱 trust 誒、呃，當你生前，即係我哋講緊 trust 其實可以有好多種嘅，最簡單叫做生前信託。生前信託嘅意思就係、是、當你生前嘅時候，呢、這個信託喺度係完全係當係透明嘅，係唔會有誒、呃、一啲。你信託入面嘅財產，其實等於你自己嘅財產。你個信託係係隱形嘅，係同佢透明嘅。佢個生前信託會只係會喺你過身嗰日先會浮出水面，成為一個獨立嘅個體。但係當你喺生前嘅時候，就算嗰間屋嘅名義已經擺落咗 trust 度，但係個 trust 喺法律嘅定義上嚟講係當係透明，即係 tax 同埋 in 誒同埋 legal wise 都係一個透明嘅人，唔係一個獨立嘅 legal person 喺度。咁當你當你有啲財產
喺度誒，已經喺個 trust 度，但係你仲係。即係我講緊 living trust， 你仲有啲財產喺 living trust 度，你想轉讓個名字會唔會有問題呢？喺我哋嘅角度睇係唔會有問題嘅，唔會有呢個法律問題，亦都唔會有呢個稅務問題。因為當講翻頭先嗰個嗰嗰樣問題啦，即係因為當你生前嘅時候，因為 living trust 個誒佢嗰個佢個 characteristic living trust 生前係透明嘅，下面你下面 living trust 下面嘅揸住嘅所有財產物業乜都好。其實等於係你自己個人嘅財產，你有一百個 percent 話事權，你想點做點做。Living trust 係完全係唔會唔會喺一個誒唔、呃、會喺一個 negative 嘅誒誒 factor 咯。咁但係銀行會唔會點睇咧？會唔會覺得佢一個係一個問題咧？嗱，以我所知道咧，即、就、係、是、以我誒同、呃、客户聽到嘅嘅嘅消息咧，就唔係一個問題嚟嘅。咁但係。因為因為好多銀行都知道呢、这個呢、这個 rule 係點，呢、这個呢、这個呢、这個 rule 係點去玩呢、这個遊戲，或 living trust 嘅遊戲規則係點樣？但係每間銀行有佢自己誒嗰、呃、間銀行嘅佢嗰個佢嗰、那個誒、呃、規管啊，即係佢自己嘅內內部嘅守則啦。咁佢會唔會有自己誒嘅、呃、問題咧？咁就好難講，因為每間銀行有唔同。但係從我嘅角度嚟睇。诶，从一个 legal 同埋法律同埋一个税务角度嚟睇，系唔会有影响。O K， 诶，仲暂时有冇其他问题？暂时冇。哇 ，actually， 诶、uh, ，我想问你，嗯、um, ，一个 living trust 咧入边要摆啲乜嘢喺边喺入边嘅咧？你你要注意啲乜嘢咧？啊，好啊。嗱 ，living trust 咧，你想你嘅遺產點繼承咧？其實有兩個主要嘅組成部分啦。第一個就係呢個 living trust， 即係生前信託。第二樣嘢就係個遺囑啦。咁其實呢樣嘢其實好多人都想，好多人都問呢樣嘢，呢兩樣嘢其實有咩分別咧？嗱 ，living trust 係主要係講錢嘅啫，係講錢嘅。living trust 你所有嘅財產，你個誒、呃、主要係你個屋啦，你嗰、那個誒。呃房地產啦、啊，你個銀行嘅投資帳户啊，同埋你嗰、那個誒、呃、你屋企有嘅車啊，嗱呢啲係正常嚟講都係要抌落個 living trust 度嘅。當你當你嘅財產已經入咗個 living trust 度 ，living trust 係一個其實一個係一個契約一個合約。你講明你生前想呢呢樣嘢，當你死咗之後點去分配，你個意願係點嘅樣，邊個去邊個係個 trustee， 點去分配，每個人分配係幾多錢？呢樣嘢係個 living trust 嘅規管法。呢誒 living trust 有咗 living trust 之後，你入邊嘅東西，當你唔喺度嘅時候，唔會經過法庭嘅認證。咁你喺 living trust 之外嘅東西，通常都會根據你嗰、那個誒、呃、你個遺囑啊，即係你個 wills 去去去決定嘅。嗱，遺囑係除咗關於錢之外，可以包括好多嘢。例如你遺囑，你可以講話、呃、我當我唔喺度嘅時候，我想我自己誒喺邊度落葬，我想我、呃、一啲、呃呃、一啲一啲其他同錢銀冇直接關係嘅嘢，你想點安排？呢樣嘢係主要係用遺囑去講嘅。咁遺囑係要經過法庭嘅嘢認證。咁如果你係、呃、主要嘅財產係你個錢，或者係你個。係你個係、呃、房地產啊、車啊、呃、股票啊，同埋你嗰、那個、呃、銀行首飾啊，即係你個珠寶首飾啊，你個,你個、呃、有啲名牌手袋啊之類嘅嘢。正常嚟講，你係要擺落個、呃、living trust 嘅。其他唔係呢之前所講過嘅嘢，你其實可以擺落個 will 度，擺落你遺囑遺囑上邊。咁、呃、你嗰啲 living trust 嗰嗰度咧，就每係咪應該要每買一間？屋就擺落個 living trust 係、呃，我嘅答案係你特別你間屋係諗住係長揸嘅，因為每個人好難講今日唔知聽嘅事，你可能可能忽然之間可能、呃、因意外你唔喺度，咁你間屋如果喺嗰個時候發生嘅時候，以唔係喺個 living trust 度、呃，根據法律上面嚟講係會自動去要經過呢個 will 同埋個法庭認證。係比較係誒、呃、錢銀上同埋誒手續上比較麻煩少少。誒、uh, 咁另外一個 question 咧，我就用英文講，咁你自己用翻中文翻譯啦。個 question 就係、是 mm-hmm. please comment on the importance of beneficiary 
designation forms on retirement plans like 401k, IRA, and bank mm -hmm. slash brokerage accounts. Mm -hmm. So uh, anything. So usually when you when you open uh, when you open a retirement plan uh, or um, like a 401k, you also you usually have to designate a beneficiary. So um, so um, it it can be your your fa a family member or a friend. So as long as you um, have already um, list a designated beneficiary on your uh, retirement plan, so when you when you pass, the full one k and all the underlying assets in that account will be automatically passed to the beneficiary as listed um, as the listed beneficiary of that account. So it will not go through a uh, living trust or or uh, corp probate. So um, so that's one one good thing about uh, uh, retirement plan. So is that as long as you put down the names of the beneficiaries um, on the account, everything in that account will be automatically passed to those people without going through the living trust or the corporate way process. Um, so basically, 401ks and IRA should be outside of the trust. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. It can be outside, but if you want, um, you, you can also um, include that in the living trust, but that's not necessary. Can you repeat that in Chinese? Oh, okay. Uh, 如果你已經有一個401k的退休計劃的401k啊或者IRA的 當你開個account的時候,佢正常來說,佢個計劃都會問你,要指定一個受益人,當你唔響度的時候,個受益人是誰個,要你提供個名字,我唔知你哋有記唔記得呢樣嘢嚇。咁呢個人係當你唔響度
有佢個 special purpose， 誒、呃、需要去做呢樣嘢，咁亦都有呢個可能會發生，但係正常人就唔會做咁多 trust。另外一個 question 就係話個 living trust 個名咧 ，living trust of the property 使唔使 match 佢呢家個 deed of trust 個名咧 ？So do the names on the living trust of the properties have to match the county records deed of trust exactly, or can it be your own that is different from the deed？ 誒嗱，你嗰個你個 trust 度咧，好多時候你可能可能叫做誒誒誒誒乜乜。乜乜誒 family trust 誒、呃，但係你個 trust 喺度咧，就係話誒先生唔喺度，跟住自動俾阿太太，咁之後再太太唔喺度，再過俾個仔女度。咁所以你個 trust 個名咧，你個上邊即係個個名稱點稱呼喺度咧，其實可以同你嗰個 D 個 trust 個個名係唔同嘅。但係你最主要，但係你個你個 trust 入邊嗰個 instrument 下邊寫住個名，誒、呃，即係要講明嗰個 trust D 個名係邊個，要好清晰，同埋嗰個 trust D 個名係要同。啊、uh, ，你嗰、那個啊，即係嗰個啊 ，D of trust 個名係一要一樣嘅。如果有啲人已經係之前未聽你呢個講座之前做咗個 T O D D， 咁而家係咪要想做個 trust 嘅時候，係咪要首先要 clear 翻 withdraw 翻個 T O D D 先至可以開始做呢個 trust？ 唔需要，唔需要，唔需要。唔需要呢樣嘢，你個你個 trust 可以做咗之後，誒、呃、你你 trust 咗做咗之後啦，咁你覺得你將家屋想再轉翻落嗰個啊、呃那個 trust 度啦。Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So, um, what is the role for the will under the umbrella of the living trust? Uh, say that one more time, please. Uh. Not too sure okay, about your question. So, okay, so under the umbrella of the living trust,、mm -hmm. normally has a will, has a separate document,、mm -hmm. uh, titled will.、Mm -hmm. And what can we put in that will? Sure. Yeah. So anything related to money and assets, you need to put it under under living trust. And anything that you don't want to put in. Uh, put into the the living trust. You put it on the will. Uh, for example, like what? Like for example, so I I I I actually gave an example earlier. So for example, let's say you want your let's say after you're not around, uh, you want to you want to be very uh somewhere in let's say in Canada outside of the U.S. Um, so that's something that you probably want to be included in the will, not in the living trust. Because again, living trust is all about money. How you want your assets to be distributed and to be managed.、Um, but anything not directly related to those items,、uh, for example, where you want to be buried and how long after your after your death you want to be buried, that's something that you probably want to be included in the will. Oh, okay. So is it is this document optional? Ah,、uh, it's option. Well, it's optional, but it's kind of. And and practically speaking, I have never seen people do um just doing a a living trust without um without considering or talking about not doing it well. Um, so I mean, if you only have very little assets and all those can be included in the in the trust, then that's fine. You don't need to deal with the will. Otherwise, you probably want to do it as a as a package. Oh. Um, I'm going to interrupt you there <clears throat> to add a couple more things. So in the will, and this is Aaron, by the way.、Um, so, Hi, hello.、Um, so when it comes to a will, in conjunction with a living revocable trust, there are a couple more benefits. One is that you can name a guardian for your、um, like your child that is a, still a minor,、um, because the will is. Brought into the probate court,、um, and thus reviewed by the、um, reviewed by the judge to make sure that it is executed appropriately. So that's one thing.、Uh, the other thing is also in the will, in conjunction with a revocable living trust, is that you set、um, a pour over stipulation. What that what that pour over stipulation means is that again, anything that you don't capture in your trust. 
that um, that gets <clears throat> effectively gets excluded from your trust. Um, when it comes time to go through the probate court, if you unfortunately are triggered to go through probate court, um, well, that pour over will or pour over clause would move the assets back into the distribution plan of the trust itself. So what does the pour over will mean? Um, pour over will is, it's best if I give you more of an, like more of an image to imagine. So let's say in your, um, your trust, you have this bucket that you put all your assets into and you're, you have right. inscripted in there, like the directions. Right. Now, below exactly. that bucket is the pour over will, which is like a net underneath that bucket. So let's say you like you put everything that you could in the bucket, but for some reason, something just gets past that, um, gets past the trust. Well, that will would be there to catch it and redirect that asset back through the distribution plan of the trust. Um, and the thing is, since you did not name it in the trust, what will happen is that it puts the property into the remainder and like the residue that is unnamed, like not specifically named in the trust. So whoever gets the residue will get that asset that has not been, um, that had not been accounted for. So that's what the pour over will does. Uh, I have another question. I just wanna make sure that uh, Alice's question gets answered. For stock savings that are already names the beneficiary, should it be inside the trust or not? Aaron? Oh, can you Andy? I'm gonna read, I'm gonna if, the question one more time, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, if if uh, stock account or savings account, checking account already names a beneficiary, should those accounts be put inside the trust? Um, it is at the discretion of the holder. Um, there are, and this is a slide that I had, um, that I had included in my previous presentation but there are these different techniques to be able to avoid um, like probate. And some of them are like death upon, like payable upon death uh, designations, such as what you can do with your checking and savings accounts. Um, when you, if you don't want to name, uh, to move the, uh, to move the accounts into the trust, you don't necessarily have to, uh, you can direct it over to whoever it is that you want payable upon death. Now, one thing about that though, is that if you were to put it in the trust, you can add more stipulations um, so that you don't distribute your assets immediately. Like with, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to encourage a child to uh, complete college, um, well, you cannot do that with a, um, with a checking account at the bank. You can say, oh, give it to them after they complete their fourth year. Um, but you can do that with a trust. So that would be a purpose of doing that, but you don't have to. This in. question is related to a TOD, D, and a living trust. How can you eliminate the conflict if both exist, a TOD, D, and a living trust? Which process should be done and what should be, they be doing to clarify and clean up uh, the TOD, D, and living trust? Andy, would you like to answer that or? Do you want me to answer that? Can you answer it for us, Aaron? Sure. Sure. So um, I'm just going to double check the question one more time. But effectively, how do you like what takes seniority is like the question there. And how do you um, how do you reduce or how do you kind of effectively? What should they do? Should they get rid of the TODD? Should they uh, put it in a living trust? Should they leave it in the TODD? Like what, what should they be doing in this situation? So they should move, um, they, well, they should set up the living revocable trust, move the assets over into the trust and then, um, and then eliminate the TODD. Like that's, Thank um, you. It, yes. Do we have any further questions? Feel free to either chime in or type it into the chat room. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question earlier uh, regarding a safe deposit box, um, should the items inside the safe deposit box be listed inside the living trust? 
So it depends on what it is, but primarily what you store in a safe deposit box um, is something that doesn't necessarily have title to it. So um, a part of establishing a trust is that you can, um, like when you transfer assets into the name of the trust, well, what do you do when you have assets that don't have title that you can't necessarily prove? Um, like, like there's not that direct proof of ownership. Well, there, um, we do have documents that effectively transfer one's personal property into the name of the trust. Um, that's, that's to answer that question. Now, if it's in a safe deposit box, you can also identify that um, and uh, connect that to the trust itself so that the, the contents are funded into the trust. And there's also um, included in our estate plans, our documents where you can determine the specific asset that you want to give, like, and who you want to give it to. Um, we have the ability to, to add it directly in the trust or also have a list where you uh, you can itemize where you want it to go and when and, and to who. I think another question came in is if there was a deed that was under a married couple, two people, mm -hmm. and now they are uh, divorcing, it's under dissolution of marriage, should each party have his or her own trust? Like, you know, they divorced and so Bob and Mary, should they each have their own trust? Well, I think there are two questions there. First is whether or not they had a trust beforehand. I mean, typically when you divorce, you wanna uh, revoke your trust, um, but uh, from there, um, and I think that's like, there's a lot to answer that question. Um, you don't necessarily have to put a property into the trust, but you can choose to. Um, it all depends on the dissolution of the marriage, how things may go, um, and how you may resolve that ownership of that property, and whether or not you're going to, if you choose to own the asset with your ex-spouse together, I mean, you could put, both technically put your ownership interest into a trust, but do you want to own the property with your ex-spouse? Like, that's something, um, yeah, that's something that's a little bit beyond more of like a legal consideration and more of a, like, is it practical or not? So, um, there's another question. Since a will is a separate document, does that will need to be notarized? No, you only need two witnesses, uh, two disinterested witnesses. So, um, so they can't be someone who would benefit from the will. Uh, so it does not have to be notarized. We can require it if you want to, but it doesn't have to be. Someone just asked about. Can you talk about the difference between a irrevocable and a revocable trust. Um, I guess there's some benefits and disadvantages of each one. Sure, sure. Um, and so without delving into the specifics, on a high level, they're just two different categories. A revocable trust is one where the person who puts the assets into the trust retains control over those assets in the trust. So effectively, they're named as a trustee. Uh, in doing so, um, it, all the assets stay within his estate or her estate or their estate. And um, so you can manage the assets in the way that you normally would do anyways. Now, when you create an irrevocable trust, there are many different types. Um, there are some where uh, you can buy life insurance um, through an irrevocable trust that doesn't fund your um, that goes towards paying your future estate taxes if you do. Um, but um, on a high level, irrevocable trusts just mean that you're moving part of your estate out of your estate and you have, you're no longer able to directly, directly control like where those assets are going to go. But um, you've kind of, um, to put it into another metaphor, it's more that you have prepared a ship, like a boat that you're gonna set off to sail. Uh, you put your assets into there, you have the instructions there, but you set it off to sail and you have no control anymore. Um, it, but it also reduces your total taxable estate. So irrevocable trust can be a very good way to leverage um, uh, the tax regulations, while at the same time, revocable trusts are good in terms of maintaining control, while at the same time, uh, while also um, hopefully 
preventing probate from occurring in the future. Depends on how you structure your estate plan. Are there tax benefits for doing a revocable? Why would someone want to lose control of uh, their the, the trust? Oh yeah, there can be tax benefits. Um, uh, so <clears throat> the reason, <clears throat> excuse me. So when you set up an irrevocable trust, um, you are effectively moving those assets out of your estate. So let's say if you had, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's the federal exemption um, or federal threshold of $11.5 million, where if you exceed that amount in your personal estate, um, well, you're gonna get taxed later on if you do, and the tax rate's at 40%. Now, let's say you had $15 million worth of assets, and you say, all right, well, I don't want this, 11, like the $3.5 million difference um, to be taxed at 40%, all of a sudden you're losing X amount of dollars. What you may choose to do is you may elect to like, set up an irrevocable trust, and it, as I mentioned earlier, there are di different types so uh, that are effectively would take us much longer and uh, to go through. And I'd reserve that for a discussion with whoever's asking the question. Uh, we can talk about it later. But <clears throat> by moving your assets into an irrevocable trust, you move it out of your name um, so that when you, when you pass in the future, well, your estate um, would be, we would want to keep it below that $11.5 million threshold so that you're not taxed at 40%. While at the same time, when you set up an irrevocable trust, as I mentioned earlier, you are still transcribing certain um, instructions there. So if you want to benefit your future, like let's say you want to benefit your kids or whoever it may be, you can still do that, but you'd, ha uh, you'd have to effectively move it out of your estate so that you can prevent further tax, like larger taxation um, and thus maximize your, what your assets are doing for you and for your family or whoever you want it to benefit. Um, Great. Yeah. So what to consider when choosing the person as the doable general power of attorney? So it all depends on who you trust. Um, the durable power of attorney uh, on a broad level, I like you can stipulate what you want to give them the power to do. If you have a business, you can say like they can keep running the business, they can enter into loans for you, they can, um, they can actually even like if you elect to do so, allow for them to change uh, the trustee, like trustees, beneficiaries and so forth, if you elect to do so. So it all depends on um, the like your situation is we trust uh, to be able to further your interests and will protect your um, protect your assets. Now, um, happy to go through like what we normally structure in a durable general power of attorney, um, but that would have to be a separate conversation. It's uh, we have many different points, and you folks can elect to what they want to keep in the So another question is, um, who should be the successor trustee? Is that typically the spouse or the wife or husband? So um, the successor trustee, first off, I want to point out that if you have a, um, if you're married, normally you have co-trustees that are established initially. So it's the husband and the wife that are both trustees that manage the trust then whoever passes, then the other person is a trustee. Like they, um, then from there, um, that person is one who controls the assets in the irrevocable trust. Now from there, you can name your successor, like you would have successor trustees. You, um, some people name their children to act as a trustees. Uh, some act or ask like friends or, or banks or their attorneys. Um, or CPAs to be their trustees as well. Um, and it all depends on who that person trusts with their to distribute their assets in the future because trusts do not go in front of the court um, or they're not necessarily required to go in front of the court unless it's challenged. So you wanna have somebody that, again, you can trust 
Um, but normally, initially it's set up as like both spouses are trustees, then eventually somebody is named as the successor. So is an executor's name a must? And what happens if an executor passes away too? Okay, so um, an executor is the one who manages the will um, or any, uh, effectively, like the trustee manages everything that's in the trust. <clears throat> um, the executor manages the rest of the person's estate. Um, by that, I mean that the executor also like wraps up the credit cards at the end of the day, um, cancels the phone bills and so forth. Um, so I want to distinguish that first. Now, when it comes to, um, I'm gonna address the executor question specifically. Um, if, you, if your executor lists run out, like let's say you have two people and they're both gone, well, uh, the next thing is to go to court to identify who the, that, um, who's the appropriate person to represent and execute the, um, the wills, the, what has been um, set up in the will. Now, well, one more thing I'd like to add though, is that normally you have the trustee and the executor be, um, be the same person, that the trustee can administer the trust while not having to um, having to reach out to the executor. Like if you have two people, it becomes a little bit more burdensome. Um, they normally name the trustee and the executor as the same person. <laughs> so another question is, um, if there's a deed that has two names, what happens if one person has a trust and the second person doesn't have the trust. Does the second person's assets go to court uh, for probate if they are deceased? I mean, well, it all depends on the value of the uh, the value of the property. Um, if it's above the threshold, then yes, it would. Um, but only that interest, that specific interest, would go into probate court. So. If the property was worth five hundred thousand, and two hundred fifty thousand was in somebody's trust, and the other two fifty is not um, in any type of estate plan, well, that two that two fifty would be um, potentially fall into the probate courts, and from there, that portion would go through probate. I think Fanny had a question to follow up on the durable power of power of attorney. Should they also have a backup person in, in yes. as their, yeah, okay. Yeah, they should because here's one thing that I, I haven't mentioned in this presentation yet is that when you nominate somebody to be either your trustee or co-trustee, um, your executor, durable power of attorney, or your healthcare agent, um, they don't have to set the role. Um, they don't have to set the role. They can decline, like even if you nominate a guardian, the nar the guardian can decline. So you normally want to have at least a backup, like one backup to the initial nomination. And one thing about the trust I want to point out is that when you name successor trustees, um, it is not advised to name successor trustees that um, are not U.S. citizens or uh, U.S. residents. Um, for legal purposes, for tax, for, uh, tax reporting purposes, um, and also just for logistics reasons as well. Um, there, there's a lot of problems that can come if you name somebody uh, from overseas to uh, be your successor trustee. Thank you, Aaron. Of course. So thank you so much for your information today. So time gone fast, we are ending up, we're ending our online workshop today. So thanks again for being here, Andy and Aaron. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.